making room and making plans, moving up, letting go, and kicking back. There are things in life that matter, and at NBT Bank, we're always here to help make those things possible. Because making it easier for you to live your life and focus on what matters to you is what we focus on every day. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Welcome to the 21st Century Business Forum. I am your host, Clay Young. This morning, our guest is NFL great Drew Brees. He's now an analyst for NBC Sports. But you may not be aware that Drew is also a prolific businessman and investor. Now get this, he's co-owner of Surge Adventure Parks with 15 locations. He has franchise investments in Duncan, Jimmy John's, Walk-On's Bistro and Bar, Happy's Irish Pub, and Stretch Zone, just to name a few. He also serves on the boards of B1 Bank and the equity firm Franworth, and he is a global brand ambassador for PointsBet. As quarterback for the New Orleans Saints for 15 seasons, he injected success to a struggling franchise, leading them to nine playoff runs, seven division titles, three NFC Championship game appearances, and of course, the franchise's only Super Bowl title. He retired in March as one of the most accomplished signal callers in league history, a 13-time Pro Bowler and perennial record holder. But today, Drew is with us to talk business. Well, good morning, Drew, and Happy New Year to you, brother. We're in January and a new season for a lot of us and business and, of course, an organization. And it's great to have you with us. You know, going into a new year, I'm sure you have to have a mindset to get your team and all of your activities moving in a direction. Let's talk a little bit about that. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> it's uh, it, it's been it's been a bit of a transitional year for me. Uh, you know, I go from being a, uh, a professional athlete, quarterback for the New Orleans Saints, and, and being a professional football player for 20 years. Um, you know, and and really even beyond that, you know, four years of college football, and then four years in high school where I was pretty serious about it. So, you know, you sit there and say, all right, for 28 years out of my 42 years. I've been focused on being the absolute best quarterback I could be, right? So two thirds of my life. And then all of a sudden that just, that just stops, you know? And, and, and even while that was something that was anticipated, um, you know, knowing that that was on the horizon, I couldn't play football forever. At some point I would retire. Still, there's just that big adjustment because literally you wake up every day with uh, this routine and this focus of you know what you have to do to be the best quarterback you can be be the best leader uh, for your team um, how you put them in the be best position to succeed and all of a sudden you just have to switch gears and it's like well you know what do i do now so it has been a really interesting year for me to say the least well, what what are some of the steps that you you put into play as you're starting a new year you know the last couple of years have been such uh, anomalies for so many people because of the coronavirus and everything that's going on. You know, what steps are you taking to get you and your team a little bit more focused and motivated to get into January and get the most you can out of the next 12 months? Yeah, well, uh, it, it has it has been an 18 months unlike any other, uh, you know, really call it two years. Um, it's uh, it's amazing that it's been that long to think that we've been dealing with with COVID and, and the effects of it and just kind of the daily uncertainties. Um, you know, I, I I'd say that um, it's it has certainly made uh, you know me value uh, you know the time that I have with my family, the relationships, uh, not only that I made while I was playing football, but also. Um, even now, as I look forward to the future and the things that I think I want to accomplish both personally and um, within the teams that I'm involved. Um, and I, I, I think it, it's, I think it's just made me even more intentional and more purposeful uh, with everything that I do um, and how I'm planning out the next year. Um, it's just, made me very grateful, but also just wanting to be extremely intentional with how I'm approaching each and every day. 
You know, in coming back stronger, you talked about the three skills you have to have to be a great quarterback. <laughs> kind of tell us what those three are, and then how would a CEO apply that to what he or she is doing in business? Yeah, well, so you know, the first is leadership. Uh, and so really, you know, what is leadership? Very simply put, it's the ability to motivate and inspire. And by motivating and inspiring, you are bringing out the best in those around you. And that is something that certainly a quarterback, a CEO, any person in an executive position must have. And we all have our own leadership styles. Um, but at the end of the day, I think if you, if you think about it as how do I get the absolute best out of this person? Um, first and foremost, I think that the, the thing that's most important for a leader is showing people how much you care. And I think that on a daily basis, when I was a quarterback and even now as I've transitioned into the business world and in the other, the other teams that I'm a part of, it's still that same approach as to you know, letting people know each and every day, maybe the gratitude that I have for them um, in the role that they play within you know, the team framework. Um, also, uh, you know, certainly you, you lead by example, right? You know, others are inspired uh, more by what they see you do over what they hear you say. Um, I've learned that more so with being a father <laughs> and having children. Um, you know, there's that saying, and I was told this, you know, when my kids were younger is that they don't hear anything you say, but they see everything you do. I would say that very much applies to the leadership role as a quarterback or as a CEO as well. Um, you know, the other part is, is toughness. You know, when you, when, so really for a quarterback leadership, toughness, well, toughness physically, certainly because you play a very tough sport, but mainly mentally. And it's that, man, you are going to have all types of adversity. You're going to have all types of moments and circumstances where all of a sudden it feels like you're veering off course. It's going a direction that you and your team didn't expect. And yet you have to be the calm hand that steers the ship. Um, that was actually a, a direct quote from Bill Parcells, one of the legendary you know, coaches of all time uh, in the realm of football. Um, he had this, these t uh, qu 10 quarterback commandments, and that was one of the key ones was be the calm hand that steers the ship. In other words, when chaos is going on around you, when things seem to not be going the way that you had planned, you have to have that very calm, poised demeanor that lets everybody know that you are very much in control and that, hey, this is, this is just part of the process. Like, we're good and we're going to find a way. Um, the other thing is character and accountability. Um, in any organization, especially as a quarterback, when things are going well, you tend to be the one that gets a lot of the credit. And at that time, you deflect that to the team. You know, hey, it's, it's, it's this person. It's this position. It's that position. It's all these people that are playing these key roles that are making this possible. And then when things aren't going good and you receive all that criticism, man, you got a shoulder. <laughs> you got to take on that burden. That's the responsibility that comes with leadership. And I think when – those around you see you take that responsibility and that accountability. It takes pressure off them. I think it makes them want to work even harder to achieve the ultimate goal with you and for you. It's so interesting you say that, Drew. You know, as in business, if it goes well, the team made it happen. If it's not so well, it's on the CEO to take responsibility for it. There's another thing you talked about with with your list of, of characteristics you must have to be a, quarter, a, a great quarterback. You talked about toughness. I'd like to ask you this. As people watch you, there is an intensity you carry as you play on the, on the field, an intensity in your preparation, but it never looks like ego. So how do you balance showing the focus, showing the attention to detail without being off-putting to the degree that people can't come to you and, and ask for advice or come to you and, 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 and maybe want to uh, get information on how to do something? Yeah, listen, that's a great, that's a great question. And I think, uh, again, everyone has, everyone has their own style. Mm -hmm. um, I would say this, like I have always been a very positive person. Um, in fact, I've had teammates call me annoyingly optimistic, <laughs> right? Like even when things seem like it's just, you know, 
man, how are we going to get ourselves out of this hole? Like, how are we going to find a way to win? You know, this and that, like, I am annoyingly optimistic. Hey, we are going to find a way, like all this is doing, we just have to kind of redirect and create a new path. Right. But we're going to get there. It's just going to be a different path than what we thought it was going to be. Um, and, and maybe it's just, I, I just feel like everything in life is part of a growth mindset. Like everything that's thrown your way, every piece of adversity or bit of unfortunate circumstances that you face, it's all part of the journey, right? And it's all meant to strengthen you and mold you and give you some sort of skill set or like develop you in some way that's going to help you achieve the ultimate goal. So like I am uber positive, like annoyingly optimistic. That's fine. You can label me as that. But but I, I always feel like we're going to find a way. Um, and so with that it comes like a confidence, right? There's a confidence that is borderline arrogant. I mean, you know, like when I, especially when I get into competitive situations, like, yeah, I flip a switch and I kind of like go into a certain mode, but it's like, um, man, I, I, I know, I know what, I'm capable of, I know what we can do here together and, you know, we're going to, we're going to find a way to do it. And so, um, I, I do feel like though, one of the best attributes of a leader and, and I, and I learned this from Sean Payton, uh, was like open door policy. Like if at any time, any of you on this team want to know where you stand, my door is open and you come in and you may not like what I have to say, but I'm going to tell you the truth and I'm going to be honest and fair. Right? right. And so as, as someone who is, is part of an organization, I don't, I think there's, there's no better, there's no better situation to be in where you feel like you can go to the CEO or the leader or the quarterback at any moment and, and, and be open or have an open, honest and candid conversation. But like telling the truth, to me is the most important thing because who, who doesn't want to know exactly where they stand and how I can get to my ultimate goal. Like, for example, this is what I would always tell guys on the team who would come to me and say, man, I wish my role was bigger on the team or on the offense, right? Like, why aren't I getting more touches? Why aren't I getting more balls thrown to me? Why aren't this and that? And I would say, listen, whatever your role is, whatever your capability is right now, like th there's, there's, there's a, there's a skill that you have right now that we need on this team. And here's what it is and be the best at where you are right now, because that's what this team needs. Now your ultimate goals and aspirations are much greater than this. Like you, you, you're here and you want to be here. Well, here's what it's going to take to get there. And that's what that open door policy is about too, is listen, I'm going to tell you exactly where you are and why we need you here right now. And I'm also going to give you the path by which you get to here. And I think as someone who's just trying to reach their full potential and feel like they're bringing the most value to the organization, I feel like what you know, what more would you ever want than than that to be told the truth? I love that answer. You're into so many things. You're an entrepreneur and an investor. And at one point you've been kind of a banker. You've got business partners and <laughs> part of franchises and everything. It's like, I, you know, for as someone who tries to squeeze as much as I can into a day, I am in awe of how much you get done, um, at, which I think is inspirational to people in business. But what are some of the attributes, ca characteristics, values, things you look for in an opportunity that might require an investment or an opportunity to be a partner with someone? Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's obviously the things that are kind of investment where it's like, hey, I, you know, I, I trust the team, like I'm betting on the jockey, you know, there, and, and I'm just, that's kind of part of an allocation. It's another thing to say, all right, where am I really going to invest my time, my energy, my passion? And so first and foremost, I would say authenticity. So do I, do I love this product? Do I love this, you know, this, this segment of the market? Do I love this aspect of business? And, and the second thing is, you know, fellowship and relationship. And I think that that's where you start looking at, um, you know, who are those in, in positions of leadership within the company? And do you share the morals? Do you share values? Do you share um, the same vision for where the company is looking to go and how it's going to grow? Um, the other thing is just uh, like curiosity. Um, like for me, there's some things I've gotten involved in because on the outside, I said, you know what? Like, I'm really curious about that, right? Like, I really want to learn more about that. And as I've gotten into it, I realized, wow, this is something that is really unique. It fills a great need. Um, I, I, I can bring value 
to this. And so, you know, that's, that, that may be another reason why I get involved with something. So authenticity, your passion, fellowship and relationship and curiosity and growth mindset. You, you mentioned so many things in there about the product and, and the relationships and being in business. You know, it's, it's one of those things that you can relate to sports as well, and that's team chemistry. You know, a, a lot of, and we see this now in, in pro sports, that these dream teams come together but don't necessarily have the end of season success. What factors would you say contribute the most to good team chemistry based upon what you have done in sports and in business? Yeah, first and foremost, it's all about culture. It's all about creating a foundation by which people love coming to work every day because of the people they have a chance to be around. Um, certainly the competitive drive in you is also the goal, right? Or the vision in achieving that goal and that vision. But to me, so much of achieving that goal and vision is about the people that you get a chance to share it with and do it with and enjoy it with and the roles that you all play and the way that, you know, my motivation so much when I was playing football was not because I wanted to achieve that ultimate goal, but it was because I wanted others around me to be able to feel that feeling. And I did not want to let them down. And so um, the, the attributes to that. And, and as I think about, you know, some of the greatest teammates that I've had a chance to be a part of. Um, I'd say the number one trait is be the same person every day, you know? So again, like the annoyingly optimistic, you know, thing with me, like I wanted people to, whenever they interacted with me on a daily basis, be like, dang, that guy is just like super positive, right? Like he just believes good things are going to happen. Like if somebody said that about me, I'd be like, bingo, right? Like, that's what I want that that would that's what I want you to take away. And hopefully that improves your own, you know, uh, kind of outlook and, and maybe the way that you're approaching the day. If that's rubbing off at all, like that's that's what I want. That's what I would want you to say. So be the same person every day. I think about the people that I knew, like when I walked in every day, like Taysom Hill, I was going to see a smile on his face. Right. Or Pierre Thomas or Darren Sproles or, you know, Zach Streif. I mean, Toronto Armstead, so many guys that I just knew exactly what I was going to get out of them each and every day, like in the locker room, in the meeting room, on the practice field, game day. And, and so, which kind of leads me to my next um, kind of statement. And that is, like when you start thinking about the type of teammate that you want, think about you yourself being the type of teammate that you would want to others. So like I, 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 I would, so just an example, I knew this, like obviously the preparation that I had to, um, that I felt necessary to be the best that I could be on Sundays and put everyone in position to succeed. There was a ton of film study, right? A ton of film study. So I remember I picked a parking spot um, at the facility. I would park in the same spot every day. And I parked in a spot where literally I knew that everybody had to walk by that parking spot to get in the building. And the idea was I wanted that my car to be in that spot when people walked in the building in the morning and when they left in the evening. Cause I always wanted them to know that I was there and I was there and I was working and I was working because I was trying to put us all in the best position to succeed and to win. Um, so being the type of teammate that, you know, you would want each and every day. And then the other thing is, and I learned, I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I learned this until the, until maybe the last five years of my career, but that is like celebrate the small victories. You know, sometimes you get so, you know, locked in and focus on the ultimate goal and this and that. And I think at times it can maybe wear on you, maybe the stress of that, or just kind of the daily grind. And so, to break up that monotony, like, man, make sure that we are all celebrating the small victories. And, and, and those are awesome ways to, to kind of break down what is like an ultimate goal into these like smaller goals in order to achieve that ultimate goal. And then have these celebrations, right? Enjoy these moments to getting to that point, because that's also great team building opportunities. It's great opportunities for everybody just to relax for a moment and to connect maybe on a more personal level. And it's, so it's not always just about work, but it's about enjoying one another, and enjoying the team. Talk about having a plan for the work. Yeah. So, so I would call that process. 
right? You know, so uh, football certainly and, and business as well is a results driven business, right? You know, I mean, we would, we'd, we'd say in the bill, like if you're a head coach and you're not winning many games, well, guess what? You're probably not going to be the head coach for very long. Same as the quarterback, right? Same as, you know, some of the other high profile positions. Um, so it's easy to get caught up in the results because it's such a results driven business. But I think if you think of it that way, you're going to kind of drive yourself crazy. Um, you have to focus on the process because if you focus on the process, the results take care of itself. And there's this whole kind of mindset of if you have a good process, if you have good daily habits, right? If you have that, that really positive routine, that is going to equate to good results. And it's also one of those things that like when you, when your head hits the pillow at night, if you can say, you know what, I did everything I could to put myself and my team in the best position to succeed. Like you should be able to sleep like a baby. Right. <laughs> and, and, and also when you step on the field, you should be able to say, you know what, I can relax and just go play because I know that I've put all the deposits in the bank, right? I've put everything I needed to do to prepare to go out and be my best. It's there. I've done it. I visualize success so much of, I think my preparation involved visualization because there's no way that we could practice every scenario in practice itself. It required so much additional time in the meeting room where I would take a play and I would say, all right, well, what if I got that? Like, what's the worst thing? What's the worst thing that can happen? What's the toughest defense I could get? And I would visualize what I would do. And so in essence, I was creating answers to the test. So that when I stepped on the field, I already had all the answers to the test. I knew exactly what I would do in a worst case scenario. If they had the perfect defense again, I knew exactly what I was going to do. So if I had all the answers to the worst case scenarios, then man, what do I have to worry about? And I've already visualized like winning the game so many times in my mind that by me just stepping on the field, all I was doing was just, you know, now, now having a chance to actually enjoy the moment because I had already kind of grinded through it in my mind. So um, focusing on the process and then knowing that the result will take care of itself, that's, that's, that applies to the game. It applies to business. You know, as a former quarterback who did it at the highest level, you know the importance of audibles because as you referenced in your mind, you're trying to see every scenario and considering what you would do in the worst case scenario. In the last couple of years for CEOs, people have had to call audibles about the way their businesses have operated. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of being able to make an adjustment as a CEO and to be able to get your business model to conform to the new realities that you may face that you couldn't have predicted like a pandemic or a hurricane or something of that nature. Put your ego aside and it takes incredible discipline and incredible just buying into the team element, right? Like what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to win this game. Okay. How do we do that? Well, it's going to be through running game and great defense. So receivers, you know what guys, I know you were born <laughs> to catch the ball, but this game, we're going to need you to block. You need to block your butt off. You need to block defensive end on toss crack plays. You need to block linebackers at times, safeties, corners, certainly. But, man, that is how we're going to win this game. And we need you in your role in this. It's just as important as the left tackle or as the center, right, or as the guys that are paid to block, right? So, right. man, like, but that is the ultimate team. That's the ultimate team is that, you know what, this may not be what your role is in the grand scheme. You are a wide receiver. But to win this game, right, to win this moment, to win this set of circumstances, man, this is what we're going to need you to do. And that's that's the ultimate team, ultimate team. You know, you, the passion just kind of leaps off the screen as you're talking about this. And obviously you were a great leader and are a great leader. It's still in business. But if you're describing your leadership style, if someone walks up to you and uh, they, they'd never met you, never heard about you, and they say, you know, I, I'd like to come to work for your operation. Tell me about how you lead. What would you say? Well, again, um, the, the, the first thing I would say is, man, I, I want everybody in the organization to know how much I care about. It. And so just finding, finding little ways to, to portray that. Um, and I can just, I can tell you, you know, some things that, that I've, I've done in the past. I'm, I, 
I, I love, I love to read. I love to, I, I'm so curious about so many things and especially uh, when I start thinking about others that are in leadership positions, whether it be uh, our military or whether it be executives or uh, coaches, um, uh, parenting. I mean, in so many cases, parenting is leadership. Um, and so you just take all those things and you combine them into, well, you know, what is, what is my style and you know, what, what, what do I want to portray? And, the, and, and I think, I think the greatest thing you can do as a leader again is when, when you walk in the building, people know how much you want to win for them and how much you want to perform for them. Um, I just think it takes the relationship and the connection to a whole new level when they know how much you care. Um, the other thing is, and I've kind of lived by this, is don't ask anybody to do something that you wouldn't be willing to do yourself. And and so, you know, as young players would come into our building with the Saints, um, you know, there is this there's this learning and growing and maturation process that takes place as that, hey, here's how you become a professional. Here's how you prepare. And so as I'm communicating that to them, I feel like the best ways to do that were well, don't just listen to me, just watch, right? Like after practice, we don't walk immediately off the field. We take the things that we want to improve upon from that practice. If we missed a route, if we the timing was a little bit off, man, we're going to stay until we get it right. And then from there, we go to the weight room because we always finish the day in the weight room. And then from the weight room, we go to the training room because we never want these little ailments with our body just to, to go, um, you know, uh, by the wayside, all of a sudden something small becomes big. Then we go to the film room, right? And we always, you know, we end the day with taking the game plan and just kind of logging it away in the memory bank here with, with, with what are those new concepts were, right? We're just kind of blinking through the practice film, right? And we're going to talk through those things together. So you just have, you just kind of lay the, 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 the routine out for them, but you say, listen, not only am I telling you about this, but we're going to do it together. Right. Um, and, 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 and I think too, is, is just how you are able to bring out the best in others and instill confidence in them. I think so, so much of that is, is, uh, just how you approach each and every day. And again, it's some of the best leaders I've ever been around, never said a word, but I literally, I could watch them and I watched the way they approached their work and how much pride they took in it. And I was inspired as much by that as anything. You know, it's it's interesting. You keep such a, a hectic and busy schedule, but every anyone who knows you or has watched you uh, know how important your family is to you and that it's a top priority. You think about being the best in sports and in business and how much time it takes to really be good at something. Talk about managing and maintaining that balance between excellence in your professional life and also commitment and, and being committed to your family and your personal life. Yeah. And that is, that is, that is the great work life balance. Right. And, and I think it's something that if you would say what has been like, not the biggest struggle, but just the biggest area of focus for me throughout my career. I mean, that's been it, you know, especially as uh, my kids have gotten older um, and because you just don't want to miss a second with them. Right. And so, you know, where is that balance between being the best you could be at work um, and, and giving that the time and energy it, it, it requires. And then, you know, being the type of husband and father you want to be as well. And I feel like those things are so intertwined, you know, honestly, because I think there is a fulfillment that we all get when we pursue our passion. And ho hopefully everyone is in a situation with their job where they feel like, man, like I am pursuing a passion. Like I, there's a great purpose behind, you know, what I'm doing. I, I think we all strive to find that, right? And if we found that, which certainly as a as an NFL quarterback, I felt like, man, I'm doing something that God has allowed me the opportunity to do, to give me uh, so many uh, blessings, not just physically, but put people in my life, to put me in this position, to have this level of responsibility. And I know it's for a very short period of time in the grand scheme of things. So I just want to like maximize every ounce that I can out of this and understand the influence that I have being in that position as well. Um, so in, when I felt like I was being the very best that I could at my job and being purposeful with that, like that is what then allowed me to go home and be in the moment with my family. Like, in other words, my schedule with, with football was like, I knew at seven o'clock I was literally walking out the door of the saints facility, no matter what at seven o'clock, I'm walking out because I want to get home in time 
to read my kids a book before bed because that is our special time. And you know what, if I don't have that, then man, like my bucket is not filled, uh, you know, emotionally with, with my kids. Uh, and, and like that would, I would feel like there was something really missing there. And so what did that do with me on the work front? Well, I knew that I had to be so purposeful and so intentional with my work so that I got everything done I needed to get done. So there was like no goof around, no messing around. Like I had work to get done. Had to get done by seven because I was walking out the door. And when I went home, I didn't want to be thinking about work, right? I wanted to be so in the present, in the moment with my kids. And, and so honestly, that balance, it was almost like that time at work made me the best I could be with my family. And then getting that bucket filled with my family then allowed me to wake up the next day and be the best that I could be at my work. You know, so that wherever I was, I was truly in the moment with what I was doing. It's I mean, look, it's it's evident. I mean, the world got to watch uh, your son on the stage with you as you are uh, celebrating a Super Bowl championship. And it's it's amazing the example it sets. One of the other examples that you've said is is philanthropy and giving back through the Drew Brees Dream Foundation. And uh, it's it's been generous in so many ways in New Orleans. Share with us why philanthropy and community building are such important things to you and your wife, Brittany, and why it should be important to companies and CEOs to give back. Yeah, well, um... Again, I, I feel so blessed and so fortunate to have been in the position that I was as an NFL player. And then now the, the influence in the position I'm in, you know, beyond the game. Um, in fact, in a lot of ways, I feel like what football did was just position me to where I am now in my next chapter um, and the influence that we'll be able to have. Uh, my wife, Brittany, and I always always knew that we wanted to establish a foundation. Um, in the beginning, the mission was to help improve the quality of life for patients with cancer. My wife had had two aunts who passed away from cancer while we were in college. So we actually watched them go through that. And so we knew we wanted to do something that was cancer related, especially with uh, pediatric cancer. So we did a lot with Children's Hospital here in San Diego when I was playing for the Chargers and other organizations like that. Uh, when we came to New Orleans, we really broadened the scope of the foundation to include the rebuilding efforts because this was six months post Katrina. So it was rebuilding schools, parks, playgrounds, athletic fields, funding child care programs, mentorship programs, really helping to bring families uh, back to, to New Orleans to, to help rebuild communities um, really kind of from from within. And um, I mean, it's amazing to think about the the communities that we've had a chance to be a part of, uh, the organizations that we've had a chance to support and watch grow and the difference that they've been able to make. And uh, it, it, I feel like, you know, each, each kind of chapter to the, to, the, to the foundation's journey just continues to get bigger and better. And so now we are focusing on a lot of initiatives that include housing, healthcare, education, creating economic opportunities and economic development. Uh, in underserved communities, continue to help with a lot of children's organizations. And um, it's, it, I feel like we've been given such a platform and such an opportunity to make a difference for so many. And I know the things that I needed when I was young to succeed. And so much of that was just having people believe in you and let you know, create a vision for what is possible for you. And then to be able to have the resources to be able to provide for others to uh, see that vision come to reality is that's what it's all about. And I think from a company's perspective, you know, that corporate responsibility, just understand the influence that you have. And when everyone is doing it together and when everyone is creating that roadmap, that vision, and then the resources, uh, you, I think the greatest thing for a young person is just knowing that anything is possible for them. Well, I want to ask you this, looking at the timeline of your professional career and in business, because our audience is CEOs, Drew, and you know, it's a lot of people right now who are watching who are likely in a tough space in their business because it always happens. You think about being drafted in San Diego and ending up in, the, in, in somewhat of a, controver a, a competition with quarterback, then you get injured and you come to New Orleans and go on to have a Hall of Fame career that leads to all of these things. And now in your second chapter, you still have a high profile, you're doing television, you're in business, you're able to do more. And I say that to make the point that sometimes in life as in business, circumstances that seem insurmountable 
sometimes have to happen to get you to where you're ultimately supposed to be anyway. And and I personally have experienced that and know it, and there's some things in, that you wouldn't change. So I'd like you to talk about that, that if you're in a tough space in your business, stay on track, stay close to the mission so you can get to where you're supposed to be. Talk with me about that. I mean, failure is the toughest teacher, but it's the best teacher. <laughs> um, you learn a heck of a lot more through failure than you do from success. Um, and really it's those countless failures that, that bring you to that success. And, you know, I, <laughs> the, 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 the crazy thing, you know, I look at every level that I play from high school to college to the NFL, and I can pick a moment, like a defining moment in each of those spaces where something happened, where I, I literally thought to myself, this is the worst thing that ever could have happened. <laughs> you know, and it sounds trivial now, but like it, it, at the time, when you're just so consumed with it, you think to yourself, man, I've never had to experience anything like this. I've never had to overcome anything like this, like this bit of adversity, this injury, whatever it was, it's the worst thing ever could happen. And then after you go through it, after you battle through it, after you learn from it, a year or two later, you look back and you say, you know what? It's probably the best thing that ever happened to me because what I'm doing now or experiencing now or what I learned from that, I never would have learned had I not gone through that. And, and I think that's where this growth mindset, you know, comes into play. And that is, if you literally look at every moment, every set of circumstances, every bit of adversity, and you just say, man, this is like, God, I don't know why this happened right now, but I know it's here. To, I know it's meant to make me stronger. It, it, maybe it's to divert and go this other path. Right. But man, it's here to help define who I'm really supposed to be or who this company is really supposed to be or, or, or what our vision or direction is. And I think when, when, when you take that mindset, you, you spend a lot less time kind of feeling sorry for your situation and you spend more time focusing on how it's going to help you grow and how it's going to strengthen you. And without a doubt, it's because of that adversity and those failures that I know that I've learned so much and been positioned to, I think, uh, accomplish the things that that I've had a chance to accomplish, but also, you know, it's it's really what has shaped the journey. That's a perfect segue to our final question. You know, it's said that, uh, you know, experience is the best teacher. Is there one thing or a couple things that you may have learned the hard way that you wish you would have known when you started out in business? <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, you know, Again, a lot of this, a lot of this goes back to, um, you know, just creating your fundamentals uh, for business, uh, how you're running your company, or how you are evaluating investments. Um, and I, I, I think when I when I look at not so much the mistakes that I've made, which we all have uh, within business, you know, whether you just chase the, chase the bad idea or, you know, lost money doing something. Um, I think, I think what, where, where I think, where I think I always kind of take solace is if I'm, if I'm doing something that I love to do, which falls into that authenticity category and that passion category, if I'm doing something I love to do and I'm doing it with people that I really love being around, you know, and I feel like we have a clear vision and clear goal that we are chasing together, you know, um, and we are growing, you know, even if it's during a time like COVID where you're having to, you know, divert and, you know, redirect and that kind of thing. Like, even if there's failures along the way, or even if you feel like, man, we were shooting for the moon and we landed amongst the stars, like, like to me, there's still a ton of success in that because, uh, I mean, what's better than, than doing what you love to do, doing, doing it with people that you love to do it with and growing along the way? Like, isn't that what life is all about? And uh, I mean, who's, who's, to say that, who's to say that there's this, there's this, you know, this short-term objective that you have to hit? You know, it's, I think this is all just within the framework of growth opportunities in life. And I think that's the way, I think that's, that's, the, that's the mindset that, that I try to take with it is, man, do what you love to do, do it with the people you love to do it with and, and keep chasing those goals and those dreams. 
I heard a quote the other day that says the problem with most people is that they don't aim too high and miss. They aim too low and hit. <laughs> so sometimes life is about really aiming high and you have certainly done that. Listen, man, you made Louisiana proud for a lot of years and I'm certainly not blowing smoke with the way you carried yourself both as a professional uh, and as a, a citizen here. And it's good to see you still having success. Uh, and I wish you much, much more of it, brother, because you've earned it going forward. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us this morning and sharing with these CEOs some of your experience. Experiences. It's great being with you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining me this morning and a special thanks to our sponsors for making this first episode of the new year possible. Please join us in February when you'll learn how to increase your sales in 2022 with our guest, the great Jack Daly. He is a global sales trainer and sales coaching expert who inspires audiences to take action in areas of sales, management, and corporate culture. He's great on training too, and it's gonna be a doozy. See you then.